Come on, man. Come on in, everybody. Come on in right here, right now. This is Black Power Media, and this is the Remix Morning Show. We're here to give you that boom bap breakfast, that radical news, and all that right here. I go by the name of the air doctor. Let me introduce you to your host. We have no other than come out. Okay, Franklin! Okay. Let's uh <laughs> That's, uh, that was it. There was no. Where's the rest of the host? <laughs> I was looking behind my computer. Where they at, B? Where the rest hey. of the folks at? Hey, they. Uh, well, Kim. Kim says she's running a little late. She had to walk the dog real quick, so she had to walk them dogs to represent Wu. Nope. Uh, true. True. <laughs> true. Indeed. True. Indeed. We, we, got, we got a new YouTube member, Josh Morales. Josh, yeah. what's up, son? All right. All right. I like it when I'm by myself. I think that's what what's that's that's what's happening. That's what it is. That's what it it's is. It's got to be. I mean, what other reason could be like at, at 803, we drop in new membership and all that kind of stuff. Look at that. It's all because yeah. of me. It's all because of me. We blowing up in the world. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? What's going on with your, what's going to be going on with your weekend? Oh man. Let me see what I got going on this weekend. I got to do another wedding and nope. yeah, another wedding. And, uh, I also have, well, tonight, uh oh, I will be on Real Talk with Dr. Sudiata. So that's tonight at seven o'clock. Um, also this Sunday, yeah, I'll be doing Sundays. We got special uh invites to the cookout. So you know, I told you all the all the all our our, our allies, our, our Caucasian allies, will be coming to the cookout. That you know, gave something to the culture. So. Oh, okay. And like, give me a, a for instance, like who gets to come? Who's an ally that gets to come to the culture? As as you've seen in this picture, we got Tina Marie coming. We got a uh, Hall from Hall and Oats. We got um. Let me see. We got somebody we're gonna talk Did about. That, Oats can't come. This Hall. Eh, we'll see. If we, <laughs> we'll get him. To, we'll get him a to go play. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what Oats is, man. What is nobody? Oats? Nobody never knew. I mean, man sat there and did the guitar, <laughs> and that's what he did was the guitar, and that was that was that was his contribution. I don't. I, mean, I don't even know if the dude wrote. You know what I mean? I, I know somebody who might know who who Oats is. Lord, burn it <laughs> down, Kim <laughs> Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You got that dog walk? <laughs> Not yet. It's still, still a little chilly. Still a little cold. Uh, still a little so cold. Still cold. We, we was wondering what is Oats from Hall and Oats? What is his role? What's his role? Not that, his role. Uh, what that, is he? In terms of his ethnicity? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's a white boy. That's white, man. I don't think so. What do you think he is? Wait, he where's the kinda, evidence? He looks kind of Latino to me. No, sir. No. Nah. <laughs> no. Come no. on, with that mustache. I was gonna say, don't let the dark hair fool you. I mean, that's, that's just. That is, <laughs> oh, that's white man. That's uh, yeah. that's that's ethnic uh, something. Oats. Wait a minute. Get the, get Irish. The, get the chat room to find out what oats is, because come on, we got. I mean, but out. besides white, like, what are we trying to uh, exactly figure out here? Your doctor is telling me who's going to be invited to the pick out, the cookout, like yeah. which one of the white allies. But he invited Hall, but not Oates. Yeah. Oh, sir, that's a that's he said, folly. He said Oates can get a, a to go plate. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Nah, nah, those so guys. I wonder, like, what would be the basis of letting him in? Because he pals around with Hall. But why Hall, do y'all think that? Hall gets a pass. But why do y'all think that Hall, the, the 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 musical offering set forth by both Hall and Oates, how, I don't see how one could be included and the other not. All right, I'll give him a plus one. All right, let's <laughs> put that out of bed. Okay. Oh, cool. KC and the Sunshine, but KC. Exactly. They, the they, get, they get to come through. Billy Joel, he gets to come through. Okay. Billy Joel? Yes. Billy Joel don't get to come through? Why not? Why what what, what music did Billy Joel do or sing or steal? <laughs> he did. He did the stranger, <laughs> and then he did. Uh, you Up might be girl. wrong, might be wrong, but you might be right. Uptown girl. It's not enough to get him in. I don't understand. Uptown girl. 
Uptown what? girl. Is nice. I said eight is Joel. Yeah, yes. I don't think it's nothing. I, Springsteen comes before Billy Joel. What? I mean, no. I'm just saying. Springsteen. <laughs> Springsteen? I, I read Springsteen and Billy Joel. Oh, you bugging. You're bugging. I mean, yeah. I, if you go and invite, you get you can't. I mean, how does Billy Joel get an invite? Billy Joel got some dope, dope soulful music. He got some soulful music, man. Come you don't know about soulful. soulful. I don't huh? even know about. Uh, I, I think we're overreaching with soulful. But does are are there some soul elements to it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But soulful? I don't know. See, I think Phil Collins makes soulful music. Yeah, we talk about Phil Collins to get an invite. I give Phil Collins. Bill Co yeah, he get an invite. Yeah. Come on, man. Let me let me let me hit y'all with something real quick, man. Cause y'all, y'all, Billy Joel, a soulful Billy Joel song. Who in the hip hop field get to come? Hold on, hold on. What no, you no. say? Do you, no, no. Go ahead. Do, do it. Who in the hip hop field? Mac Miller. Uh, we got Beastie Boys. Is we Mac, got uh, Mac Miller, the one with the tag song, the one with the pop popping tags. Is that dude? Nah, 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 nah. Oh, okay. You thinking about Macklemore? Hmm. Same difference. Exactly. Oh yeah, Michael McDonald comes. Please. What? That Keep is not a good bed. example that of Billy Joel. That don't and get you an invite, son. That terrible is. example. Keeping Bad the faith. Example. Keeping the faith gets you there. Just because you you secretly you're a closet Billy Joel fan. <laughs> that doesn't mean he's beloved by the black populace for an invite to the cookout. Be. Oh man, yeah, what Billy about Joe doesn't qualify? He, he, I'm sorry, yeah. he, he, he has made some some tracks with that has some soul elements. He does not qualify for a cookout invite, in my opinion. No, you're right. No, 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 no. You got you got to invite him to a private dinner, just you and him. <laughs> he can't come to the cookout. Man. Yo, mad people ain't coming to my cookout, man. What's going on with that, man? Yo, we got we got Kalanji in the in the building. He said he ain't coming. We got some other people. <laughs> Yeah, because Kalanji ain't coming because he's black. It's for black people. And George black. Michael, that's right. George Michael, he he gets a pass. He gets George a he gets an invite. George Michael, come I on. I guess father figure. He did some stuff with Aretha. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he come down from heaven and come. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. We we oh, we where he is. All right. Well, well, that's what it is. Let me let y'all get to it. Um, yeah, I'll catch you on the break. Stop messing with your hair, Kim. Oh, wait a minute. Dead animations. Dead Man Animations, twenty five beans. Big up, Dead hey. Man Animations. Thank, Thank you, Dead you. Man Animations. Thank you, Dead Man Animations. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Today is it's it's actually we closing out our GoFundMe campaign. What? It's fall fundraiser season is over. This huh. is going to be the last weekend for folks to down to to donate. Mm -hmm. And folks so want to support by um by here doing some super chats today giving us some resources today or going straight to the fundraiser i'm a little disappointed by the fundraiser i'm not gonna lie to you i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna lie to y'all i think we could y'all can make it up to me y'all can make it up to me by donating here in the super chat today do like i did that one time you know what i'm saying make it make it rain make it rain make it rain <laughs> make it rain <laughs> rain at one time. At one time. Y'all only did it, yeah, tw maybe twice. That's how when, when I was sour at ear doctor for some reason. I just kept giving money that day and shit. No good reason at all. Are, are, are we approaching another anniversary? Or am I, my, my, my time calendar is just way, way off. I think it's your, I think it's our anniversary. The remix or the channel? I meant you and I. I mean, we, I think we should tell the public about our secret relationship. <laughs> come let's, out. Let's, let's get it out open. Let's get come it out. out. Why is it that you want to give the illusion that you are knocking down all the BPM ladies? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> we are all Kamal's lovelies behind the scene. <laughs> Little Kamal's angels, you know what I'm saying? Let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Come out there, yeah, Kamal's angels. Oh, no, but I don't know what. What's the anniversary? I'm not sure what it is. Uh, there, there may not be one. I mean, listen. Ever since the pandemic, Kamal, my perception of time and how time passes is gone. <laughs> it's obliterated. I don't, I know nothing about anyway. So I just had a feeling maybe that maybe we had a, a significant date soon approaching, but I don't, maybe, maybe now, now I'm doubting it. Hmm. So forget it. I'll let the ear doctor check on that. Let the yeah. ear doctor check on that. Cause yeah. I, offhand, I don't, you know, I don't remember the regular ones. Um, 
like when we first, I think we first started, I, we've been around for at least the, the remix show has been around for at least now a year and a half. I think we started 420. Huh? Oh, that's right. 420. 420. That's right. That's right. That's right. See, God, thank you, God. Yeah. So 420, you know, it's like the booming voice from whatever. Oh, know. oh, ear doctor God. Yeah, God. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome, <laughs> my atheist son. <laughs> That's right, because so five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So yeah, that's almost like 18 months, like 17 months since we first started Remix Morning Show. And it's, you know, we keep on talking about expanding to a couple of more extra days, but we still haven't figured that part out just because of the, the host and the stuff like that. Oh, why I gotta be calling the wife though? Son, son, mind your business though. Mind your business. You know what, <laughs> you know what my relationship is. You don't know how we get down. You don't oh, know. shit. I don't know. Everybody, I'm not saying we do, don't get me wrong, don't get me, <laughs> I'm not that getting you know, but you know, but you don't know. Somebody gonna be sending your wife a DM at work. Kamau said, Did you see your husband on the on the YouTube? Talking? Girl, you better check out what he <laughs> <laughs> exactly, girl. Yeah, come okay. and hit him over the head. Oh Lord, I hope that's not the case, but anyway, what's up, everybody? What's up, remixers? Here we are at the close of the conclusion of what I hope has been a productive week here on the Remix Morning Show. You guys have had a, a big dose of Kim and Kamau in the ear, Doctor. We appreciate you guys rocking with us this entire time, whole time. Um, <clears throat> as we move along, <laughs> I don't really know uh, where we are. We're actually about to bring the ear doctor back here momentarily. Yes. No, you came in. We were doing the chit chat, the chitty chat chat. You came on, and we were going to continue with the chitty chat, 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 chat. And we time almost soon to bring the air doctor on who's popping on as we speak. Bam! With a chitty chat, 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 chat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I ain't go too far. I ain't go too far. So um, let's take our first break right here. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to give a, a spotlight. <laughs> you do be cheating on me. Yo, man, come on, man. Stop Jackie dumped me, man. Well, I mean, Jackie ain't been around in weeks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They going to start calling you Community D. Oh, anyway. <laughs> oh, the community ah. movement, D. <laughs> and that's what you get right here at the remix one. And show, Yeah, yeah. What's good, everybody? Welcome out. Make sure y'all hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. This is the Remix Morning Show. We do this every Tuesday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. So tell a friend to tell a friend. It is on again. Like we said, the fall fundraiser is coming to an end, so please go ahead and support that. And also go to Patreon.com and let, let me let you know tomorrow, if you are a Patreon member, we got something special. That's right. We got something special. We talking about the House of Dragons right here. I know some of y'all don't know about it. Some of y'all do, but it's going to be a good conversation. So I would come on through if I was you. All right. So, boom, as y'all know, I am doing my special invites cookout this weekend on Sundays. So I was like, oh, let me bring up one of these artists that's actually uh, going to be there. So I said, let me spend a, send a special invite out to Bobby Codwell. That's right. Who is that? Maybe y'all know. Come on now, sing it. Uh. You're still regretting the love you left. That's right. Robert Honey Hunter Codwell. He is a singer, songwriter, musician. He's released several albums spanning from R&B, soul, jazz, adult, contemporary. He's known for his, those vocals right there. A lot of people know him for this song right here. That's right. What you will do for love. It went double platinum. That song is so hard. I mean, it came out. And, and what the funny thing about Bobby Cadwell is the, the record label he got with. Now, first of all, you, you'd be like, yo, how did this dude get this soulful mix? So he's from Manhattan. He moved down to Florida. And his, his, uh, his mom was a good friend with Bob Marley. So they started hanging out. He started hanging out with Bob Marley. He used to love to listen to... Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, and stuff like that. And um, he was also able to play all these different instruments. So he was in a, a band called Catman Do. 
He was doing that for a while. He also got to be a, a rhythm guitarist for Little Richard back in 1970s. So he was with all, all, the, all the heads that was doing the soulful music. And with that said, what the R&B album, uh, the record label did, is they did what, what uh, they do to the black artists. They take their picture off the cover and put the album out so that they could get the sales. So this R&B record label was like, all right, well, we ain't going to put this picture up on there and we're going to sell this album. And they did the same thing that the white label's been doing forever and they came up. And Bobby started writing for a bunch of people. He did songs for Phyllis Hyman, Roy Ayers, uh, uh, all types of people. He wrote for a bunch of people, Roberta Flack, Al Jarreau, uh, Bob Skaggs, Chicago, Natalie Cole. I mean, he got over like 17 albums. This dude has been putting in that work and he got some pretty dope music. So with that said, I am inviting him to the cookout. All right. So make sure y'all tune in Sundays for that. And uh, let's go ahead and get back to the Remix Morning Show. Yeah, you know how we do. All right. Right here on Black Power Media. <laughs> I knew nothing about Bobby Caldwell except that he was white and he had a couple of R&B tunes. And to list off, I guess, his pedigree, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. I had no idea either. I knew the songs, the two, those two songs, mm -hmm. but I had no idea that dude was white. I, mean, I, mean, I had no idea. I before no this idea. morning, you didn't know he was white? Nope. I never saw a picture dude before in my life. I just heard, you know, the songs just come on. You just know the songs. It's, I never knew. Yeah. I would be like if his mom was singing that with Bob Marley, there was some fucking going on. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you know, I mean, you already know what I'm saying. It's like we read his mom. And he, was and he got with Bob Marley, <laughs> and he got sampled from hip hop, as you know. Biggie Smalls did the uh, "My Flame" song, uh, "Sky's the Limit." That was that sample, and then um, you know, uh, "What You Gonna Do for Love," Tupac sampled that, and "Open Your Eyes," Common sampled that for. Um, yeah. Hold on. That was Bobby Caldwell doing that Sky's the Limit? Oh, 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 oh. Okay. I'm thinking I'm thinking of the refrain, though. Sky's the Limit and you know that you keep on. Yeah. Just keep on that's what Bobby that's my brother. Yes. Yo. Right here. Check this that's out. The, that's the track. But I'm talking about the actual chorus. You talking about Biggie? Nigga. <laughs> Who did the song where the where the chorus is sky right. is the limit? Forget the forget the track, forget the, the instrumentation. No, that's that's soul. Sky is the limit, and you know that you yeah. keep on, oh, but you want to do what you want. That's uh oh man, don't get me started. So the biggie sky is the limit track is a is a is a melange of, of those samples, multiple yeah, yeah. samples. Okay. And they, they took that chorus. Yeah. So, so what's the name of that Bobby Caldwell song with the instrumentation of the sky's uh, limit? Uh that's my flame. Mm, okay. See, look yeah. at you. I'm learning stuff. And I, I thought I was a music head, and you just taught me some new things. Thank you. Well, y'all act like I come up here and I don't be dropping knowledge when I I make knowledge born out here. Hey, come on, man. Listen, I'm, I'm right there. 112. 112 skies the that's that was it. That's well, 112 was on the biggie song singing oh. the singing the hook. Oh, oh, but that's cool. not one twelve song. That's big. That's song. not their song. Yeah. Okay. Oh, nah, I'll put that, I'll put it. Pull that I'll up. Pull that up. I'll pull that song up. But that's, that's, no, no, that was some good stuff. He could definitely come, you know, from heaven to hell, wherever between he at. To I'm assuming <laughs> he's dead, right? He dead. He got to be dead. He's dead. I don't, I don't think he's dead. He's, he's, seven, dead. he's seventy-one years old right now. Yeah. He's only seven. I thought he was a D train. Keep that's what D train. It is. That's right. Keep yeah. it. Keep on. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm so I'm happy that Bobby's alive. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I hope he's comfortable knowing that his mom had sex with Bob Marley. Shut um, up, Kamal. <laughs> Get out. Stop slandering <laughs> people's <laughs> mothers. <laughs> what is wrong with you? I'm just saying. He, she got that soul in him. <laughs> she, he, she blessed, he blessed the Adrian. All right, yo. I'll catch y'all next time. Ay, ay, ay. Y'all be wowing. I know that ear doctor. He's out. No, <laughs> that come out, K. Franklin. Mm. <laughs> Crown Heights, no chill. I'm just Ooh, pointing out the obvious. Just the obvious. You can't say, you cannot say that Bob Marley was hanging out with your moms and a white woman, too. Bob loved, you know, let's be real. 
Let's be real. There's a lot. Bob loved the white women sometimes. And I know y'all got news to get to, but I wanted to say this real quick. A lot of people say that white people steal black music. All the time. I feel like they don't. I feel like they, wait a minute, I feel like they mimic. Not really steal because we created all genres. We Mm. created everything. So how can you steal like something that has been created? How can you steal something that you did not create and that you make for another audience and you don't pay the people who actually made it? But we always fall for the front man. It's not. It's not the front man. It's the record label. It's not the person singing the song that was like, "Oh, let me." Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I think there's people who are real artists who enjoy the music, who love the music, like you said, who grew up with it. Yeah. I, and 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 it's not always a, a a hard line of what that is, but there's definitely thieves of black music out. There. It's the record labels, not the artists. No, the artists can participate. The artists. I mean, there's a lot. Of, I mean, it's a part of the history. If I just to have the white folks do the cover, the cover version of black music. And they put mm. it out there, and again, they get the credit, they get the sales. Those white artists knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. They, they, nobody, nobody fooled them. They was like, here, sing this less black, and then let's make a lot of money off of it. They knew exactly what they were doing. Sing it to the best of your ability. But <laughs> if you create all genres of music, how can one steal if you created everything? Because if you're not compensating the people who originally created said thing, that is stealing. That's stealing. If you if you take something without proper compensation, you have robbed somebody. So that's so really something in the backdrop of institutionalized white supremacy, racism, and the rest of it. It's not again, all these artists who created all that stuff you said were not compensated, died in poverty, mm-hmm. uh, had their lyrics, their beats, their 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 instrumentality, everything, everything stolen and revamped for a larger white audience. And then they took credit for it too. Even today it happens, right? Even today, all these young white cats, all the young white music you hear is basically based on R&B and soul. And they're making hundreds of millions of dollars um, by doing basic versions of black music. And That's now the black artists can't even get put on half the time. But ain't that because the white people got money to buy the white artists? Whereas in we bootleg. Well, not only that, they got the, they, not only did they got the money, but they got the propaganda and the advertisement that makes them big, the magazines that cover them like they're the originators or the other folks who should be credited or uplifted. They got the award shows. They give them awards. They got movie deals. They got all that that's, that's going away. It ain't just like somebody put the music out. And it's like, oh, my God, Adele, you're so fantastic. Who knew? <laughs> it's like there's a whole publicity machine behind that being like, put that blah bitch right there. Boom. She's going to be on every magazine cover. She's going to be on every show. Everybody's going to interview her. She's going to be like, if you've never heard a voice like this before, there's like 40 black women who sing that same song and better, but mm-hmm. could never get put on. So it's not, is this not like somebody coming out the weeds and all of a sudden they blossom? There's a whole machine behind that that puts that out there to us and tells us that this is what we've been waiting for. We ain't been waiting for our own music, some by our own people. We've been waiting for somebody else to sing that song and do it in a way that attracts white folks or whatever. So we... We blame the record label and the media and not the artists. That's all I'm Both saying. sometimes. So the art, artists are not. Artists are not. Everybody. They, 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 uh, what are they? They're like they're not like sheep all the time. You know what I mean? They're like they're not, they don't have agency. They know what the fuck they do. And again, some people like the music. I'm not saying they don't. I don't say they're not singing things that they like, but people actually know also that they're benefiting off of something. And at least like uh, uh, at least you could say somebody like what's what's the white girl I just mentioned? Went from Adele. 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 Um, at least she'll sometimes big up some black artists, but still, <laughs> you still, and she, you know, it's just that guilt. You still know what's happening. So, well, hey, the, the, Amy Winehouse, we going to come on, man. She just all the time. She was, she was, she was, she was cracked too. Well, Amy, but Amy always bigged up black artists. Like they, they, she always kept black, black recording artists in, in, in her mouth <laughs> when talking about her influence. Oh, oh. Uh, simmer down, simmer down. But um, but no, there's some there's some very recent examples about this. Have you guys seen the discussions around Madonna's memoir online, where Madonna says that she, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically she walked so Cardi B could run. She said, "No, what? No artists out here flouting mm. their sexuality like I was." And then the internet, specifically Black Twitter, proceeded to drag her. Like, look, bitch, you didn't create shit. Okay, everything you took was from Black women and from Black queer folks. So let's not. 
Let, let, let us not over uh, over misremember the record. And that's what the white folks will do when they get to a certain mm -hmm. level or even prior to getting to that level. They will be like, oh, look at all this that I've created. Look at these trends. Look at this. Everything mm -hmm. you had came from black folks. Mm -hmm. Cut it out. <laughs> Knock it and even And I like Amy Winehouse. But, you know, she said some shit about Billy Billy Holiday that was just like as she was trying to praise some other jazz artists. It's like, you better get the fuck out of here and be with that. So, you know, again, I think I think some of these artists are sincere and they like the music, or whatever. But still, they are doing an imitation and usually a poor imitation of black people music. And they will find a way to center themselves in, in the music. Right. Like Justin Bieber, when Justin Bieber's album, whatever, the latest Grammys or last year's Grammys or whatever, he was upset that his album didn't get nominated in the R&B category. He said, I made an R&B album. No, white boy from Ontario, Canada. You didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. You All made right. a pop album imitating R&B. And it, and it was still pop. So Our producer Ricky Ryan says that we need to move on because, you know, we got news to talk about. So let's go ahead and <laughs> let's go ahead and get to the news. Let me get up out of here. Know, I met Ricky. Oh boy. This weekend. I'm I'm, I'm not done talking. I got Papa, talk. you told us this yesterday. Oh, no, Ricky was tall too. I didn't know Ricky was that tall. He's taller than me. And, and, she, and you said she hit you with the stiff arm. Like, yeah, that's true. like I, I need three feet to now back <laughs> up. She did ignore me. She did ignore me. She went around me five times. I don't like chasing now. It was pitiful. I was like, Ricky. It's like, oh. Anyway, slap the mat. Yeah, that's Maryland, yes. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Good morning. It's the Remix Morning Show, Black Power Media. Kim Brown, Kamal Franklin, the Air Doctor, giving it to you right now, live and direct on this good. What's today? I never know what day it is. Thursday, October 27th. Thursday. Lovely. Um, yeah, it, it, we, we have a, a, a good a good news show, I, I guess, in store for you all today. Kamau, um, I sent you some stories, or if you have a story ready to rock I and riz. Which oh, one you want? I got your stories up let, ready. Let's go, um, let's go off the tippy, off the tip hop, because uh, there is an update regarding the Flint water crisis and the would-be criminal uh, trial that was surrounding the elected officials and those who were in charge of such things, uh, who, who oversaw and authorized um the switch from was it from the flint river or to the flint river regardless whatever caused the flint water crisis um prosecutors plan to appeal after judge tosses flint water crisis charges against uh one uh pardon me against seven michigan officials and there might be is there is there a video piece accompanying this from fox detroit let me see it doesn't it's appear to be oh it is yeah, there it is. Yeah. You ready for it? Yep, let's, let's rock. It. Justice for Flint also does not mean that the people responsible, those all the way up to the governor's office who were in charge, who, who allowed this and made this happen, walk away free with six-figure salaries. That about sums up how many in Flint are feeling after a judge threw out criminal charges against former state and city officials for their roles in the Flint water crisis. Tens of thousands of people were exposed to dangerous levels of lead, and outbreaks of Legionnaires' disease killed at least 12 people and sickened dozens more. The whole state said no to an emergency manager that the city of Flint ended up getting because our leaders lacked the political will to run our city. So what happens when you have a court that lacks the will to get justice for a city? Who takes them over? Genesee County Judge Elizabeth Kelly dropped the charges after the state Supreme Court ruled the one-man grand jury used to indict the former officials was invalid. The evidence gathered against them tainted. We're ecstatic, um, but she did the right thing. Randall Levine represents Rich Baird, one of the officials now in the clear. Mr. Baird is ecstatic. Uh, he was wrongfully accused. 
The water crisis began in 2014 when managers appointed by former Governor Rick Snyder took Flint off of a regional water system and began drawing from the Flint River to cut costs. They never treated the water to lessen its corrosiveness. And as it flowed through old pipes, lead-filled water flowed into people's homes. We still drink, cook with, brush our teeth with, and try to wash our faces with bottled water. Eight years later, they still don't trust Flint water. Attorney General Dana Nessel got rid of the special prosecutor on the case when she took office in 2019 and appointed Solicitor General Fadwa Hamoud and Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy to handle the prosecutions. They released a statement saying, the prosecution has pledged to exhaust all available legal options to pursue this case, and that pledge remains. The team will review today's ruling and continue its pursuit of justice for Flint. And you want to talk about justice for Flint? This is not it. Mm -hmm. This is not it. Your attorneys, you're the attorney general, you're the highest legal voice that we have here. Mm -hmm. Where is justice for Flint? My hope still in this is if you're saying you are going to exhaust all legal possibilities that you do not come to me a month later and say this was your last legal possibility. The state agreed to pay $600 million as part of a settlement with Flint residents, but the attorney general's office says that compensation is not the same as accountability for those who allegedly allowed an entire town to be poisoned, and it is not the same as justice. Now, former Governor Rick Snyder was charged with two misdemeanors, but he was also indicted in the same process that the state Supreme Court says was illegal. His next court hearing is October 26. That was yesterday. What happened at the court hearing? Now I want to know. I'm <laughs> guessing maybe maybe not much. Um, but uh, just for, further disappointing news coming out of Flint. Can you imagine Kamau in it, a, a, almost an entire decade? When I listen to, I, I, I've interviewed Melissa Mays a couple of times, the, the, the white woman there. Uh, and for her to say for eight years, they have been using bottled water to wash their face, to brush their teeth, to cook. Eight years, eight. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And nobody is sitting inside of a jail cell. No one is sitting yeah. inside a jail cell. The water isn't completely fixed. And again, all this money that we keep talking about, they give to Ukraine to persecute a war. Um, all that is done, bam, at a, a snap of the finger. It's that same, those same resources, again, instead of building bombs to, to, to hand over to folks or drones to hand over to folks, could have fixed the water crisis years ago. But on top of it, it's like this was no accident, right? We all know that this was not an accident. This didn't happen by happenstance. They knew what the outcomes could be if they switched the water supply, and they did this to save money. That's the only reason they did it. And who do they want to save money? By by making by making sure or targeting poor folks, working class folks, mainly black folks, to drink water that they wouldn't drink themselves, right? So they, yeah, it's not shocking that this is happening, and it's not shocking that the court system now is going to go out of its way to protect these elites, right? These uh, these these electoral elites are going to be protected because that's what the state does. Nobody gets justice in this case if they were or they were poor. If they if if somebody had 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 poisoned a, a bottle one bottle of water, somebody got sick. If it was a poor person or or somebody who's doing something vindictive, that person would get charged with felony count after felony count after felony count. Here you have a system that literally millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people got sick from, got ill from, many uh, many folks is listed at least 12 uh, died, but yet here, no one dies. So it's only the poor that get punished. Uh, if you're rich, if you're, if you're a political elite, for the most part, you're gonna escape things like this, particularly when your victims aren't other rich people, but poor people. It kind of reminds me of the, the anticip anticipation that liberals usually show when there is another leak about or you know another drip in 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 the 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 stream of things about Trump potentially being held accountable. Oh my God, he got subpoenaed. This could be it. No, <laughs> this is not going to be it because Trump is wealthy. He is politically powerful at this point. And exactly the same thing with these Michigan officials. These are rich people. These are politically powerful people, politically connected people. Um, everybody, 
held accountable under the law. No, that's 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 a fallacy. <laughs> that that's mm -hmm. myth. Only poor people, people of color, black people are held accountable under the law. Rich whites, politically connected non-whites, mm -mm, they are going to skate on everything, regardless of how how egregious the 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 acts or the negligence that they oversaw was. So I just feel terrible, continue to feel terrible, not only for the people in Flint, but for people in towns across this country where the water is not accessible, the water is not drinkable. And and these elected officials, people placed in positions of power to oversee this, I mean, it's just a job to them. Like they don't even care about the quality of life and the impacts that they are having on people living in these communities who, I mean, water come out, water, literally the, the, the stuff Basically. of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the basic thing, that, and like you said, like that's not it's not job one. They again, if if it was all these uh, uh, um, building of prisons, all of this, all of this stuff around uh, 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 making weapons, all of that gets funded right away through the government, through uh, through government programs, uh, without without a hitch, right? Without without a second thought. But if it comes to infrastructure for everyday people, no. If it comes to making sure everyday people have safe water or have access to food uh, or even unemployment, healthcare, then it all gets to be that cost too much. Where does that money gonna come from? But if you mention building a prison, if you mention building or, or, or making weapons to persecute a war- Funding the police. Or funding the police, right? There's never a question on where that money is gonna come from. There's never one iota of debate or discussion that this is gonna break the budget or the money's not here for it. It's always pay for it, pay for it, pay for it, pay for it, um, because they do the job of the state. They do the job of making, keeping the state powerful, keeping a private army, I mean, a public army for the state, whether in the domestically or internationally. And so they keep it moving with that. And I think, and you know, the only time rich folks get into trouble usually is if they do take a step too far, right? Take a step too far that it can't be somehow defended or if they go after other rich folks. So I, like, you know, when you were talking about it earlier, it popped in my, my mind was like Watergate back in the 70s, where the, basically the Republican Party led by, by at the time Richard Nixon uh, um, started spying on the Democratic Party. And so the Democratic Party, that, and that, spy, that type of spying was happening, you know, prior to Nixon, both Democrat and Republican on movement of folks, on radical folks, on organizers, even the people like, like Aretha Franklin we spoke about before. But no one suffered jail time or prison time or any threat of prosecution during that time period. The only time folks were prosecuted during that time period was when they turned their they they turned on the Democrats who were powerful enough to defend themselves, make it a, a huge a, a huge issue in the country, um, and then there there was there's a force to be a response to it. That's when there's a possibility uh, of of some sort of retribution or payback or jail time. For somebody who's doing something that and when it's something that's so egregious to something that they can't defend it but other than that if it's poor people if it's working class people again if they're if they're shutting down labor unions if they're uh if they're prosecuting or persecuting organizers on the street that's okay that that no one is no one's going to be punished for that and even if it's even if it's found out they did it 20 or 30 years later they issued an apology and keep it moving yeah when people use Nixon as an example about what potentially could happen to say Donald Trump, I say, you know, you remember what happened with Nixon, right? <laughs> See, you remember Nixon got pardoned uh, too sweet, like right away. So he he faced n n no actual consequences besides having to to resign his office. He didn't anyway. Fuck him. Yeah. Uh, a couple it, of underlings under the bus. They had to do a little time, but that was it. Not not yeah. not him. Yeah. Mm hmm. So yeah, Flint, Michigan, um, st still still in the throes of the fight. So yeah, that's an update there. Uh, you got any stories? I do have a couple of more, but I mean, I do, you know, you know how we do, Kamal. We can we can tag team. We can tag team. So this is this is going to be. Uh, I'll do this story, and you can bring back up your story because I think this is yours. I think you have a story that's also related to Texas. Mm -hmm. But I was I read this the other day where Texas goes permitless on guns and police face in our public. So even despite the title, what's happening now is because folks are so eager to put forth the idea or there should be no restrictions on gun usages whatsoever, is that several states have now gone ahead and issued uh, or, or, or brought legislation that says no one no longer needs even a permit 
which means no background check and some places to carry. So um, one quick uh, uh, opening story they say is that somebody named Tony Earls hung his head before a row of television cameras staring down. His life upended days before Mr. Earls had pulled out a handgun, his handgun, and opened fire, hoping to strike a man who had just robbed him and his wife at an ATM in Houston. Instead, he struck Arlene Alvarez, a nine-year-old girl seated in a passing pickup truck, killing her or pickup oh pulling God. her. Is Mr. Earl's license to carry? A reporter asked during the February news conference in which his lawyer spoke for him. He didn't need one, the lawyer replied. Everything about the situation we believe and contend was justified under yeah. Texas law. A grand jury later agreed to climb oh. Mr. Earl of any crime. The shooting was part of what many sheriffs, police leaders, and district attorneys in urban Texas, in urban areas of Texas, say has been an increase in people carrying weapons and in spur of the moment gunfire uh, in the years since the state began allowing most adults 21 or over to carry a handgun without a license. Um, at the same time, many in uh, mainly in rural communities, other sheriffs say that there's been little change in terms of the amount of shootings. Um, and there's been different amounts of shootings throughout the Texas in terms of the lawful carrying guns could be a part of why shootings have declined in some parts of the state. That's what some folks are claiming in in different areas. This is a picture of the young girl who was killed. Oh uh, just to carry on a little bit with the story, far from an outlier, Texas with this new law joined what has been an expanding effort to remove nearly all restrictions on carrying handguns. When Alabama's permanent carry law goes into effect in January, half the states in the nation, from Maine to Arizona, will not require a license to carry a handgun. And so the story goes on to say that the next step for some of these folks who are advocating it, um, particularly in Texas, that there'd not be any uh, permits to carry a, a handgun. Right now, that law in Texas is 21 and older. And so now they're trying to push it down to 18 and older. Um, so yeah, so that's the story that's happening where, um, again, at least from the police uh, reports that are also coming in, is that these, um, in a lot of these different places also, um, so what's happening is that there's more drunk fights, there's more like, you know, raid, uh, road rage fights and people are pulling out weapons. Um, and so there's more random shootings and so forth. So this stuff is happening again as this country be, um, continues to deregulate or stop any and all regulation um, around ownership of handguns, background checks, uh, mental health checks. So that's the that, so that's the sort of the lay of the land. And Texas is, again, not an outlier. But now half the states in, in, in the United States allow this. And it sounds like there's going to be more in the way. That sounds terrifying. And I can't see how a person who is recklessly shooting a gun kills an innocent bystander. And there's no charges like there's no charges Grand decided not to indict. They brought, So basically. He acted in in self defense. It was an against accident. the nine year old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Accident. Like, and then that that was it. That's but it. you don't get to accidentally kill people. I this I'm assuming this person had to be white, and and I definitely know had the victim been white, there probably would have been some charges. Yeah. And the fact that this is a a, a, a young a, endangerment. There's like several things that could have happened. I I would think to. Uh, trying to get the sun out of here, but there's several things I think could have happened in terms of reckless endangerment or those kind Criminal of charges. negligent homicide. But apparently, a grand jury decided not. Why? But not only obviously because he's white, but because the gun freaks do not want any limitations on the ability to fire and shoot, and then to be that well, he the person felt they were in danger, and so therefore they had a right. And whatever the outcome is, is the outcome. So. I already did not want to live here. And now I definitely <laughs> do not want to live here. America is wild. This is, I mean, this is just a wild west, but 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 make it 2022. Make, make it urban centers, make it rural centers, make it the highway. It's the wild fucking west. Everybody is carrying. Uh, and so you said Texas, you said Alabama, I think Indiana is included in that list. Do I have that right, Shirley? Ohio might be in that list of places where you don't need a permit to carry a handgun. Man, listen, 
black people are we please utilize these laws to your advantage if you're able because your 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 white neighbors <laughs> and your white co-workers will absolutely be carrying and it, it is not even it's not even safer for us to carry guns because we are the ones more likely to get stopped more likely to get charged with possession even though these loosey-goosey laws are going into place i'm sure they're going to find ways to prosecute black people for also trying to take advantage of these laws but I mean, yeah. what is what is the advice, Kamal? Because it's like if if all your enemies are armed, what are we gonna be out here not armed? No, I completely agree because it's you know it's one of the things I think I've said myself is that I'd rather live in a society where all guns were regulated. I'd rather think that that would be like taking handguns and semi-automatic or whatever. So I'd rather live in a society that if it was a democratic society, if it was a fair society, if it was a humane, if it was a socialist society where those things wouldn't be available because that's not how we would treat each other or need to react to each other. But in this society, I can't, it's hard to say that, right? Because it's hard to, it's hard to suggest. And I wouldn't even suggest that people turn in their guns or not purchase them. When you said the exact thing that's happening, white folks are armed to the teeth and they're armed to the teeth for their own various reasons, uh, their own ideology of white supremacy, their own sort of so-called rugged individualism, their own history and culture of perpetrating violence at a moment's notice, all of that, boom. It means for them, having a gun handy is somehow a way to solve problems. It's a way to do things. So I would never recommend that black folks give up their arms or be the first ones to say, oh, we're going to turn this shit in. No, folks need to buy, learn how to shoot, protect themselves, and unfortunately have to be as careful as possible because that still comes with the retribution of the state, as you said, who will, in a moment's notice, prosecute black folks for the same things that white folks get away with. So and we already shoot, know that. And yeah. shoot at black folks, right? Yeah. Oh, well, they had a gun. Motherfucker, it's an open carry state. Everybody has fucking guns. Yeah. And, and and the police will find a way to murder black people still. I mean, they, they're doing it presently. They've never stopped. Obviously, this has been a part of a, 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 a unbroken chain of the state and white people, you know, self deputizing themselves and, and, and killing black people without any sort of accountability. But what, oh, I'm just- I always I'm, say, I'd rather be alive, defended than a dead martyr, right? Or martyr, right? I mean, that's, that's sometimes that is your choice. It's like either you shoot back or you're the victim of something, right? If you, if you have the ability to do it, either you fight back or you're the victim of something. And sometimes it's just like, you know, you, you don't want to be, obviously no one wants to be in that position, but if you, if otherwise you're just at the whim of, of not only the, the authorities that be, but, but individual white vigilantes who take it upon themselves to decide to, to enforce their, their sundown laws, or they're like, why are you walking here laws or why you exist laws? So all that stuff is, is you know, I don't think as a people, we don't have much of a choice except to not only arm ourselves, but be politically active, as we always talk about, to organize against um, what's coming down and to be and to have ways. Again, these these sort of white militias. I wish I, I saw this commercial the other day where it talked about um, uh, basically racism against whites, which was playing and it seemed to be an anti war knock um, uh, advertisement, but basically was flashing white folks who they claimed had been discriminated against um, in a commercial. And that was a commercial that was running on like uh, something like a, 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 a mainstream site, right? But that was the, the 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 gist of the commercial was that white folks are being discriminated against. So in in a in a society where folks cloud their imagination by mm -hmm. trying to think that they are somehow discriminated against, or they're the ones who are suffering from oppression, or there's some sort of quote unquote reverse racism, um, you have to protect yourself through organizing. And through being, and to, through having self defense mechanisms. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Uh, well, let's see where are we at time wise. We got time for another story before we go to break. Uh, let's get to that Brennan Center story there, Kamal, because uh, we are in an election cycle. Voting is already underway in a lot of places. And, you know, like everybody already knows, you know, black people actually and non-white people actually do not have the right to vote. Uh, so this is what the Brennan Center released yesterday. Massive disenfranchisement and racial uh, disparities in 2022 Texas primary. And um, the report went on to talk about after Texas enacted a new law in 2021 aimed at making it harder to vote by mail. 
thousands of mail ballot uh, mail ballot applications and mail ballots were rejected with a particularly harsh impact on voters of color. Uh, spurred by false claims of voter fraud in the 2020 election, Texas enacted a voting law in 2021 with many egregious provisions. These range from new limits on assistance for voters with disabilities or language access or language access needs to the criminalization of election administrators, um, yeah, election administrators who encourage voting. Uh, we cannot know yet the full impact of Senate Bill 1, let alone how it may exacerbate the restrictions or in the restrictive voting system in Texas had in place before the law, uh, before the law's passage. But the data from the March primary shows us that just one of the bill's many provisions cause massive disenfranchisement and major racial disparities. Under that new rule, voters were required to write their driver's license number or partial social security number on their mail ballot application and mail ballot envelope. Now, whichever number that they listed needed to match the number in their state voter registration. The rule created a variety of new ways in which a voter's application or ballot might be rejected um, though, uh, through no fault of their own. For instance, if a voter had listed their driver's license number when they registered to vote, which may have been over a decade ago, but put their social security number on the application or the ballot, it would have been rejected. As reporting this spring made, made clear, absentee applications and mail ballots were rejected at extremely high levels. These reports relying primarily on aggregate high level data or data from um, a small handful of counties showed that at some that some 12,000 applications and 25,000 ballots were rejected during the March primary and that there were other signs of a race gap. While these early reporting po uh, pointed to the magnitude of the problem, thanks to our public record request filed by the Brennan Center, we now know that about, um, we now know more about which people and which particular voters' applications and ballots were rejected. We obtained individual level, uh, individual level data listing, uh, data listing whether or not each voter and ballot, uh, wait, I lost my place, sorry. Listing. So we obtained individual level data listing whether each voter in the state requested a mail ballot, whether that request was rejected, and if so, why it was rejected, and whether every voter cast a mail ballot, whether it was rejected, and if so, why it was rejected. So our analysis of the data yielded troubling results. We found that the overwhelming majority of the ballots that were rejected were cast due to the new ID number requirements imposed by SB1, uh, by SB1, and that Latinos, Asian, and Black voters were significantly more likely to have their mail ballot and applications rejected than white voters. We also found that even when their mail ballots, uh, when their mail ballots reject, wait, we, we, we even found that when the voters successfully applied to vote by mail, voters of color were far more likely to have their hmm. mail ballot rejected. Uh, this combination of application and mail ballot rejections left non-white voters at at least 30% more likely to have an application or mail ballot rejected than white voters. Hmm. So potentially, potentially a third of voters of color, black voters in, in Texas had their mail-in ballots and or their applications rejected. So you're disenfran you're further disenfranchising people. So the people who were even able to register to vote in the first place who were on the voter rolls because they were black, Asian, Hispanic, they had stood a 30% more of a chance of having, having their, their votes rejected. Now, who do you think Black and Asian and Latino, not uniformly, but usually I would imagine that they would be voting more so for Democrats. Oh, I, I definitely, th there's definitely a correlation. I mean, and the correlation goes on not only in Texas, but again, in these other Southern states 
you know, and as we see the browning of so-called America, uh, white folks were employed every and any mechanism, legal, extrajudicial, whatever it is to retain what they consider to be the power but over not only electoral field, but um, obviously in uh, in terms of like uh, economics uh, field, uh, uh, electoral uh, politics, um, um, obviously in terms of like policing and so forth. So for them, they are they understand that this is a war for them, and that it, democracy is a cold word for power or control. It's not about democracy. It's not about making sure everybody votes. For them, it's about retaining the power of having access to these hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of tax dollars, to, uh, tax dollars and, and having the power and control to enact wars and to uh, bring out police anytime they want on us. So this for them is a, this for them is a, is a, is a power play, right? Um, and this kind of stuff is going to continue to happen. Obviously, it started, we had the voter IDs, um, we, there's redistricting, there's uh, several different ways in which they use this power that they already have to continue to keep control as a population shift is happening. Uh, that means less white folks are, are going to be, or white folks are no longer going to be the majority. Um, but, you know, they are fighting tooth and nail through every means and mechanism to keep power. So on my show recently, um, we took a look at the town of Ocoee, Florida, uh, which was the site of the biggest election day racial massacre in american history back in 1920 and basically when black folks showed up to vote white folks showed up and burned the town down right so it's just an interesting evolution right how racism and how white supremacy works so now they're not going to show up and burn the town down because black folks and non-white folks want to vote they'll just look at the name on the ballot they'll see, they'll see Lakeisha Jackson and throw it in the fucking trash, right? Like they'll see an Asian name. They'll see a, a Hispanic name. Oh, mm -mm, we don't need them votes. Like, so now the illusion there that, that we have access to voting, the illusion exists. Oh no, this is a free country. Everybody can vote. Look at, you know, Martin Luther King marched. So, 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 you know, the voting rights act could happen. Sure. That sounds all well and good, but when we look at it and examine it in practice, are non-whites and black people actually having the right to vote? The answer in 2022 is no. <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah. That that right does not uniformly exist. So this whole notion and farce of democracy, and again, I, I just hearken back to these, you know, from the liberal or mainstream media, like cable news outlets, democracy is under attack. Democracy for whom? <laughs> for whom? The rest of us, democracy never existed, ever. Mm -hmm. And really quickly, I mean, they, and they won't just stop at ballot measures because the whole, you, you know, the whole thing around the insurrection um, at in Washington, D.C. was around them filling their particular candidate. Again, whatever, whatever I think about the electoral system, but them filling their particular candidate was denied um, uh, uh, the win that they think they so justly deserved or was stolen. Right. So, you know, we'll see antics that are range from, again, uh, they have a full, a, a full uh, platoon of different, of different things that they will do um, in, in, this, in this time period. So it won't just be the, the um, uh, getting folks or names stricken or stopping them from voting. It ultimately will go back to um, more than just this. If they feel like their candidate has been denied, you can expect white folks to be marching at capitals, uh, whether state capitals or the federal capital, because again, this is this voting mechanism is just one part of the toolbox to, for them, particularly to, to feel like they have some control. And as long as the white elites control the corporations, they might want to put some, uh, uh, some, some chill on it. They don't want it to get out of hand, but they're also going to use it to their advantage when need be, because now there's a struggle around the elites, and we all are here, play, uh, you know, underneath all that trying to figure out what our role is. How do we survive? How do we how do we move in this kind of situation? I saw a story, I think it was NBC News. I'll be quick because I know your doctor standing by. Um, but they were talking about the voter intimidation at drop off mail boxes in Maricopa County and how there are white white people standing at the ballot box, the drop off box with guns on their hips 
asking people for their identification, taking pictures of their license plate. And the um, candidate, I believe, for governor there, the Republican candidate in Arizona, Carrie Lake, she's basically already said if she doesn't win, she's not acknowledging the, 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 the results of the election. Wow. Like, I mean, I'm not I'm not surprised, but I mean, it. it I'm just like, OK, come on, come through fascism, <laughs> fascism, fascism, showing her face and her whole ass blatantly. Not to say that they it wasn't previously, but God damn, like a fascism could, can't get more naked in 2022 <laughs> right now. Come out. No, that's the way that's the way that we've returned back to the time period where white racism, white supremacy fat is is full on public display. Um, there's no hiding, there's no, there's no code language. It's full on public display. And again, voting might be one mechanism, which is, is, is expressed in terms of stopping people from the ballot, but it is not the only way. Uh, but speaking to somebody who's never going to stop us from getting, making sure our votes count, particularly when it comes to his list, let's be on the air dot. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, voting real quick, I, I wanted to vote in LL Cool J as yes, one of the top 10 and one of the people that's been on the most crew songs that was hot we talking about what the yeah. fuck i thought i conquered the world crush modi hammer and ice tea's girls oh who shot you who shot you that's right that was uh foxy brown uh keith murray that was fat joe prodigy all them on that track yes and then rampage uh with epmd and on uh guess who wrote mc lights verse on self-destruction all right so uh, oh, cool, Jay. i'm just the saying top 10, the top 10 i'm just saying on every crew song four three two one and then let's just go to uh you know the yellow is top 25 i'm giving them top 25 I know. I'm done. can't be top 10 let's let see. me go ahead and uh get to our next break real quick and uh do a little quick musical break i met somebody the other day outside of the black man's lab and the sister came up and She's like, I'm an MC. I was like, yeah, but do you spit heat? And she was like, I was like, all right. I like the confidence. So let's go ahead and get to that right here, right now on the Remix Morning Show. Show, show. All right. Welcome out, everybody. That's right. This is the Remix Morning Show. I go by the name of the Ear Doctor, and I would like to ask y'all to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. All right. So, boom. Like I was telling you, I was able to talk to this sister that goes by the name of Troy Fiona. Fiola. Troy Fiola. Man, messed that up. You know how I do. Troy Fiola. Big up Troy Fiola. She basically came through and said, yo, I got some heat. And I was like, well, let me hear it so she was like all right uh follow my instagram and i got you and so i found this right here it's a song she did with another brother called locks guy that goes by lacy the great she blessed the verse on this so check it out Ride around the block and niggas smoking in with drinking. See you looking at my lies and beautiful. Dreadful thing and see you looking at my lies and beautiful. Dreadful thing and see you looking at my lies and beautiful. Dreadful thing. Oh, he like my lies, connected dots, get tired of knots, perspective yeah. block, neglect the cops. They ask a lot, but they don't know we have a lot of attention that can boil you. We come from dirt, they, they call it soil. You niggas are locked up, but I am here for you. We use that jail, but it didn't call you. Don't miss a step. Yeah, let me show you that I lie. Stuff from my heart, he love when I rub, condition his cop. Locks are aligned, I love on his parts, I love on his mind. This brother is sharp. We, we are designed, we can't be stopped. Just like a sign, his views at the top. We getting everything, losing is not a fucking option chosen by God, not by the adoption. Forming my locks, it is a process, raising vibrations. All of our chakras don't come from hate. That shit is toxic, healing this love, and he is my doctor, testing his length. Just like a proctor, going so long, we cleanse the detoxing, cooking the remedies, add all the melodies with the concoction. See you ride around the block, and nigga smoking in with drinking seed. All right. Yo, that was pretty dope. Uh, Troy Fayola. She came with them lyrics talking about chakras, locks, and all that stuff with a nice flow to it. I'm feeling it. So big up to that sister. Go ahead and check her out. Follow her on her gram right there, and you can get some more of that content. All right. So that's our quick break, musical break right here on the Remix Morning Show. Let's go back to our 
好。Give Sis an eight out of ten on that, and, and the only reason it's not ten out of ten is because I, I, I my 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 middle aged ears, I hate that flow. I have because everybody does that same flow. Like the the there is no diversity of flow <laughs> in 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 present day rap. That's the only demerit. But like her her her, her lyrics were great. Mm. Um, her delivery was great. Um, what she was talking about, her content was great. That was really good. Yeah, yeah, I, was I liked it too. I I thought the flow was I liked the flow. I thought that she could she definitely could rap. It was a good beat. That was like, yo, okay, finally, finally, <laughs> turn it up, dude. Hey, and and you know who everybody's saying that flow came from? Migos. That's right. The Migos came about ten years ago and came with that 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 whole that 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 whole type of flow, and everybody been rocking with it since. They shouldn't, but they are. Well, if you put some content and some good lyrics behind that flow, it ain't bad. Now, Kim, I would agree. I mean, sis, sis just showed us it could be done. She just did it. Word. So that's our quick musical break and spotlight. I will catch y'all next break. Peace. Thank you, Ed Doctor. Yep, it's the Remix Morning Show. Ed Doctor, Kamal K. Franklin. It's Kim Brown here. Uh, we got some more stories, Kamal. I'm actually trying to find a story because I want to talk about the St. Louis school shooter. Uh, but I, I need I need to find the right the right story because yeah, there's 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 things okay. about that story that I think deserve our attention. But if you have something queued up and ready to go, I do have something queued up and ready to go. So this is a little bit of a, um, a, a story based on irony. Uh, so a Florida attorney, mm-hmm. um, I just, this was, was in our run sheet. And I just thought it was interesting. A Florida attorney who opposed the state's helmet law dies in a motorcycle crash. He wasn't wearing a helmet. And so I don't want to spend too much time, but I'm just like, uh, so Florida friends are speaking out after a Florida attorney who fought state law helmet laws who fought state helmet laws, died in a motorcycle crash while not wearing one. Ron Smith, an experienced rider, was killed August 20th after he lost control of his motorcycle and crashed into a utility trailer. His passenger, Brenda Vope, his girlfriend, also died. He was a guy that went uh, went to, he's a guy that I went to for advice, a friend of his say. The pair met, I don't really care how they met, to be honest. Um, but Smith was traveling on US 19 North in Pinellas County when he began to slow down in traffic, lost control of his motorcycle, and skidded on the roadway, right? Um, mm-hmm. Smith 66 was pronounced dead at the scene. The medical examiner said Smith um, and Volupi had died of trauma. Um, so the thing that I was most, I wanted to go back to this part. Okay, Smith had spent over a decade fighting Florida laws that required the use of helmets, according to the Times. He represented a number of clients who violated state motorcycle requirements in court cases that have been credited with helping to overturn the the helmet law. The current law states that people over 21 can ride without headgear as long as they have at least $10,000 in insurance coverage for injuries incurred as a result of a crash while operating or riding on a motorcycle. So for me, the interesting thing, again, is like when these folks ask for these... um, I guess these individual rights to do what they want to do as they want to do it, when they want to do it. And some of this I do agree with, but some of it I think goes too far is that there are other consequences at stake because when someone does get injured in something like this and or injured someone else, mm-hmm. you know, one lives are lost Two, there's definitely other insurance. Suppose that they had crashed into somebody else or whatever, there's insurance claims and there's other things that happens um but whether or not you agree with the law or not is this almost like seatbelt laws it's like these seatbelt laws you know people can say i'm accepting uh, i'm accepting certain risk or i don't like the i don't like to drive and wear them but you're putting yourself and other folks who in your proximity in danger when you do that and you don't and you don't uh you don't buckle up or in this case you don't wear a helmet and so i think those things it's it's always interesting to me how this this interplay between people who are arguing around civil liberties, right? And their individual rights. Um, but also there's larger societal impacts 
where folks decide just to do what they want to do at any time they want to do it. Well, and that's the thing. So a lot of people feel as though, well, if, if I don't engage in this safety precaution, I'm only hurting myself. Well, not not exactly. Right. Uh, we, we see this play out or see it playing out in different ways with the anti-vax movement. And I'm not even talking about COVID per se, but like people refusing to vaccinate their kids against shit like polio and measles and mumps. Things that are um, childhood diseases that could be deadly and or fatal, but you know, my body, my choice, <laughs> right, Kamal? I hate, I hate, I hate white conservatives. How they will just jank, just gank a term and and distort it and manipulate it and try to mirror it back. I'm like, y'all are just doing this wrong. But yeah, the whole my body, my choice rhetoric coming out of their mouths um, is is all just it, it's selfishness, right? Nope, nobody. You know, people don't look at themselves as part of a community. They do look at themselves as individuals. That's, you know, part of the American societal ethos, that rugged individualism. Well, that that kills people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the long and the short of it, uh, the long and the short of it. The lone wolf dies, but the pack will survive. That that was from Ned Stark on Game of Thrones. But yeah. <laughs> that was good. I was like, oh, OK, I like that. I like that. <laughs> that was Ned Stark. I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but I just thought that was an interesting interplay between individual rights because uh, it can play out in several different ways, but individual rights and and the larger impact on society. And, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, not only did he die, the girlfriend died. And again, if they crashed into somebody, who else who else could have passed away in that situation? So, yeah. So you got you had several other stories up in there. Do you want me to any you spoke about I, COVID. you had one about that? Do you have another one you want to do? Um, I, I do have one about COVID. Uh, this is this the right one. Hold on. Uh, did it? Is it on here from the Washington Post? Do so you have one from the Washington Post? I'm sure when I bring it up, it's not going to last too long because of the. But we can get that title up real quick. Oh fuck me! Don't, excuse excuse me. me. My bad. My bad. I'm sorry. Is it anyway? Because I I had it and then it it did put me behind a paywall and now I'm grumpy. Do you want me to bring it up though? Do you want to talk a little? Yeah, bit yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead and bring it up. Ah, yeah. there we go. Okay. Hopefully, don't put me behind a paywall, Washington Post. Jeez, Louise. It will. It will. I so don't want to survive in America. Is the po but the post, the, the title is Whites Now More Likely to Die from COVID Than Blacks. Why the Pandemic Shifted. And at mm -hmm. least here we got, um, I'll read off a little bit of it now if you're behind a payroll. So, uh, paywall. So, Skill Wilson had amassed more than three decades of knowledge as a uh, paramedic, first in Memphis and then in Fayette County, two places that felt like night and day. With uh, with only five ambulances in the county and the nearest hospital as much as 45 minutes away, Skill relished the clinical know-how necessary to work in a rural setting, doing things like sedating patients into insert tubes into their airways. Uh, but when it came to COVID-19, despite more than 1 million deaths nationwide, Skill and his family felt their small town on the central eastern side of Fayette County with its field uh, grazing cattle and rows of cotton and fewer than 200 COVID deaths since the start of the pandemic was a cocoon against a raging health emergency. It says it was a lot easier to stay away from others, his widow Holly Wilson said of the largely white and predominantly conservative county of about 42,000 residents, less people, less chance of exposure. COVID seemed like like other people's problem until it wasn't. The imbalance in death rates among the nation's racial and ethnic groups has been a defining part of the pandemic since the start. To see the pattern, the Washington Post analyzed every death during more than two years of the pandemic. Early in the crisis, the differing COVID threat was evident in places as Memphis and Fayette County. Deaths were concentrated in dense urban areas where Black people died at several times the rate of white people. Mm -hmm. So later on in the story, it says over time, the gap in deaths widened and narrowed, but never disappeared until mid-October 2021, when the nation's pattern of COVID mortality changed um, the, uh, with the rate of death among white Americans, sometimes eclipsing other groups. A post-analysis of COVID death rates from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention from April 2020 through the summer found that racial disparities vanished at the end of last year, becoming roughly equal. And at times during the same period, the overall age adjusted death rate for white people slightly surpassed that of black and Latino people. 
Yeah, so it, as part of a thread on the Post's Twitter page, they 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 kind of sum it up a mm-hmm. little better. Like it says that at the start of the crisis, black people were more than three times as likely to die of COVID than white people. As of twenty twenty, as twenty twenty progressed, death rates narrowed but were not um, erased because fewer black people were dying. White people began dying at unimaginable numbers too. In the summer of 2021, the nation saw some of the pandemic's lowest death rates as vaccine as vaccines shoring up the body's immune response became widely available. I kind of don't like that framing. Then came the Delta variant. The virus mutated, was able to spread amongst the vaccinated. As erosion of trust in government and in medicine slowed vaccination rates, stymieing the protections afforded by vaccines against severe illness and death. After Delta's peak in September of 2021, the racial differences in COVID deaths started eroding. Uh, The post analysis found that black deaths declined while white deaths never eased until the mortality gap flipped. From the end of October through the end of December, 2021, White people died at a higher rate than black people than black people did. The post found. So, what contributed to the recent variation in death rates, and why? The post interviewed historians and researchers um, who studied the effects of white racial politics and social inequities in health. Uh, so, what emerged was a story about how long-standing issues of race and class interacted with the physical and the psychological toll of mass illness and death, unprecedented social upheaval, public policies, and public opinion. Um, I, I, so people are still dying from COVID. Let, let's put that out there, period, point blank. And I think, and and I and I don't know where you. Well, I know where you are, Kamau, and you have to tell me what the attitudes look like socially in and around Atlanta. But I can tell you, here in the D.C. metro area, people are still very much masking. It's not universal. It's not uniform. It's not everywhere. But it's not unusual, nor is it uncommon to see people masked, right? And there's no, you know, like, oh my God, why is that person wearing? It's it's not. It, it's it's none of that. Like people around here, anyway. I think except that we know that at least for a stretch of this pandemic, black people were dying at disproportionate rates. So I think black folks, I see them still taking the measures to protect themselves, right? Um, But I don't think the whites, (laughs) I do not think the whites uh, were taking the same mitigation strategies into play unless perhaps they were disabled, you know, um, immunocompromised or had chronic illness, right? But, but, "Quote unquote healthy, able-bodied white people. Mm-mm. They thought they thought their immune systems were stronger than steel <laughs> out here. No yeah. mask, nothing. And I think that's part. And obviously, that's part of what's taking over right now. Is I think still, and I, here in Atlanta, there's still folks. It varies. Folks who are taking precautions. Folks who are not. Um, but mass gatherings have resumed. People are gathering either sports stadiums. In my case, like rallies or demonstrations." Um, other people places, uh, you know, at, at, at school events or whatever it is, like folks are gathering again, folks are out in public, restaurants are full and all the rest of it. This is not a new occurrence, but over the last year or so, it's it's really um, almost pre-pandemic levels, you would say, if not pre-pandemic levels. Um, and I would say, you know, a, a third to half the time people are masked, but a lot of times people are not. And then I think it does, I mean, I think those politics have kicked in as in, these, you know, something that uh, this kind of pandemic, which will obviously reach a large population in urban areas first and slowly make its way to rural areas or uh, areas where more or less people live, is and has been doing that over the last year or so. When people don't mask up, when they don't do vaccines, when they refuse to do boosters, when they refuse to, to take any uh, of the precautions that have been recommended, it makes more than not a sense that this is what's going to take place is that these folks themselves based on their own politics will suffer. And we see, you know, this is not the only virus in which this happened. We see in Hasidim communities in places like New York where folks are act anti-vaccine or uh, for things like measles and, and so forth. Like when there's outbreaks of those things across the country, they're usually taking place in clustered communities 
that don't take um, uh, uh, that don't take vaccines or have religious uh, reasons for for why they don't, but they also put themselves out there as the first folks who will be victimized by this, while others around them who've had vaccines will be protected, but they will be the victims of it. And then you know you never know what variants may come up because now these things have been able to spread unlike they have in the past. So this is very much about the people's political positions, religious positions, uh, positionality in terms of where they live, but it's all catching up to folks. Um, and like you said, even though there's certain numbers that are being shown to go down in terms of death rates and the amount of people who are getting uh, the diseases as partly these, um, these uh, viruses over time, historically speaking, um, they become less fatal, but they still stick around. And so the reasons why we have things like the flu today are based historically on, on things like the Spanish flu and so forth. So they stick around, they never go away. They may not kill as many people, but they still are a threat to the lives, particularly of those folks who are, um, their bodies are compromised somehow. Um, and so they are the first ones who, who, or they're older, so they're the first ones to potentially pass away from this. But this is something that will be with us, our children, our grandchildren. And again, the less we do to protect ourselves, the less chance we have of making sure that more people survive it. And please don't forget that COVID is still the third leading cause of death in the United States. So COVID is still killing people. I know it's not a story hmm, anymore on the news. Now the stories are the flu and the RSV surge that is supposedly impacting uh, American children and American infants. But it's weird to me. I'm like, I'm seeing all these stories about RSV and flu, but how how was COVID not being even mentioned in the mix? <laughs> like, I, I, I believe that the narrative that is still being put forth uh, by the media and by agencies like the CDC is that, you know, then COVID is still out here, but you guys just have to vac vaccinate and vaccinate and vaccinate. The, the CDC is not even reinstating its masking recommendations or its masking, you know, suggestions. Like that is the best way to stem the transmission of airborne communicable disease is for the majority of people to mask while inside in public spaces. But you're not going to see those kinds of recommendations come from the CDC. They are going to push vaccines. And I know <laughs> uh, the, the vaccine debate was something that that tried to tear our little channel apart here at one point. <laughs> Come out, we, was, <laughs> we had some, some strong discussions surrounding the COVID vaccine. And I myself have been vaxxed and boosted, I think, twice. I have not gone to get this new you know, updated booster that supposedly includes, you know, protections against Omicron, et cetera, just because I, I'm I'm more skeptical of the shit. Like I'm mean, like, God damn, am I gonna get shot every six months behind this? I, I don't I don't think that's what I want to do. <laughs> what, what well, it's what slowed, yeah, that's what slowed me down too. Was like, uh, you know, I did the first boost because I, you know, again, I think that I, yeah, even though I agree with getting vaccinated and so forth, I do think we were sold something that at first it sounded as if this is going to stop us from getting the virus, and then later it sounded more like well, what's going to happen is this is going to reduce your symptoms while you still get the virus. And then it became the different variants. And then it was like, now you need to get a booster every six months. So it seemed to be something that there was no end in sight to the, 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 the need for either boosters or vaccines. Uh, but yet COVID was still out there. And so I think there became, uh, I'll speak individually, a, a little bit of like a, a like, you know what, um, I've, I've done this little fatigue is setting in. Um, I'm going to take the standard precautions of masking up. Um, and again, the whole family got vaccinated. But as far as doing the booster after booster after booster, it just seemed like it was something that uh, the, the answers to the, the answers to the, to the to the issue were clearly known by science. Um, and it became something that felt like it was being pushed as a semi um, of protection, but not knowing how accurate it was. And so it was, you know, and, and again, anybody who's going to go back and continually get shots in their arms, you're going to become doubtful as to what the impacts are, the effects are, if there's any long term significance that hasn't been studied yet. So I think all that has made people feel a little uneasy about what the possible possibilities are. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of how 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 great a protection this is or whatever, so 
I think that all dealt with too part of the fatigue that I think a lot of people are feeling, even and outside of an overt political um, uh, backlash to it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. I mean, people can have their, their perspectives about the vaccine and that's fair. But what, what, what's not in dispute is that people can be asymptomatic carriers of COVID. And COVID is airborne. It, it's some, I, I saw one healthcare professional said, think about COVID like smoke. You know what I'm saying? You walk into a smoky room, that's fucking COVID, okay? <laughs> like that, 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 that's how prevalent COVID is in the air. And there are those among us in our community, in our families, whose immune systems are not up to, to, to the task to be able to fight COVID off and survive or come out um, not only surviving COVID, but maybe, you know, not, not experiencing any long COVID symptoms, et cetera. So we just have to be mindful that this is not just about you. This is about the community. This is about the cancer patient. This is about the person um, who, who might be HIV positive. This is about the person who may have a, a, a chronic illness who deserves to be in public spaces. Stop telling disabled people and chronically ill people that they should stay the fuck home. No, they shouldn't. They should be out here with the ability to enjoy life and they should be able to be in community with people who are taking their medical considerations into play. Even if you are personally aware of them or not, you should assume that there are disabled people, chronically ill people, immunocompromised people everywhere. And you should be thinking about how you are masking with those people in mind. You may not even know them personally, but that's not the point. That's not what community is, right? We look out for each other, regardless of whether or not we know each other. So I'm just imploring, begging people, if you are going to be in indoor public spaces, please consider masking. Please consider masking. COVID is still killing people out here just because it's not being reported with the same level of intensity that it was two years ago doesn't mean that it's not happening. So just mm -hmm. just I just want everybody just to keep all that in mind, please. And speaking to somebody who must always keep in mind, who seems to be in a movie theater. Oh, you watching a movie? Me? You watching a movie? Uh, actually, I was get I got put on to an artist, and I wanted to uh share it with everybody else. Out it's there. a new artist. It's an old artist, but it's new to me. Oh, okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Right. I'm interested. I'm interested. Let's go ahead and do that right here, right now, on the remix morning show. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What's good, everybody? Welcome out. Uh, listen, in case you didn't get to check out last Sundays, we had Kim Brown come through. And Kim Brown put me on to a, a artist I've never heard before. Who am I talking about? She goes by the name of dun, 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 Sugar Pie DeSanto. That's right. Sugar Pie DeSanto. Let me give you a little bit. Ooh. Now, let me tell you about Sugar Pie DeSanto. She's a R&B singer, dancer, career flourished in the 1950s and 1960s. She was uh, born to an African-American mother and her father was Filipino. Uh, they started off in, what was that? Uh, they moved out to San Fran. So they moved out to San Francisco. She's about like four feet, 11 inches, a little short, short uh, sugar pie. And uh, she was actually girlfriends, like her, her friend when she was a girl was Etta James. That's right. Y'all know Etta James, right? Etta James right here. They made some pretty dope music together. This one right here is called The Basement. It was a dope song. Now, she got to uh, actually tour uh, back in the 1959 and 60s with James Brown Re Review. That's right. So she got to go on a roll with James Brown and them. And she would get on stage and her performance was so live, like with the live band, she would be dancing, doing standing back flips. I mean, she put on a show and she had a lot of dope, dope, dope music. So I just wanted to put y'all on to a sister that was doing her thing. She has a nice amount of singles, uh, as you can hear the basement and this one, do I make myself clear? So that is Sugar Pie, the something. About you. All right. So there it is. Go check her out if you haven't already. And uh, that is your artist spotlight for the day. 
Now let's go ahead and get back to the remix morning show. Now we do. It's all about the things you do. Mm-hmm. Moving and a grooving, using and a fooling, chasing around. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Air Doctor. What a gift. That's a treat. Sugar Pie to Santo. You guys go down the rabbit hole of her discography. You will not be disappointed because when I say sis be singing, singing, sis be singing, singing. And her and Etta James, I love that era of R&B where, you know, it would be uh, well, same sex duets, basically, right? Like, so it'd be Sugar Pie DeSanto and Eddie James singing songs together. Of course, I'm thinking about like Sam Cooke and Lou Rawls, you know, you know, doing doing songs together. Like, I just love that. I mean, for one, it, it was an era of vocals, not this modern era. I don't know what the fuck we in now, but then <laughs> if you could not sing in that micro in, in the microphone in front of them people with mm. that live band backing you, they would yank your ass off the stage. Now nah, you gotta go, Shorty. <laughs> you you not carrying these notes properly. That was never Sugar Pie DeSanto's problem. Sis can blow. Mm-hmm. Here, doctor, is she still alive? Is yeah. she still alive? Uh, I think she is. Yeah, Should she's eight. Age 87, <laughs> you said sugar foot. She ain't got diabetes. It's oh, sugar right. pie de santo. <laughs> sugar foot is still alive. Okay, you got it. 87. Yeah. I've never heard of this person before in my life. Yeah, yeah. Kim put me on. I was like, okay. And I didn't I was... hear about sugar foot. I understand. Sugar yeah, pie. Sugar pie. My bad. Because uh, I went, you know, on these streaming services, they will suggest, you know, similar artists. So, well, hey, if you like Etta James, you'll like Sugar Pie DeSanto. I said, who is Sugar Pie DeSanto? She has a ballad called Maybe You'll Be There. She'll put you on the floor, okay? <laughs> she will put you mm-hmm. on the ground. Uh, but I'm so glad, like, that I found, like, I was able to discover her. And thank you so much, Ear Doctor, for highlighting her because... I, I, the ways in which black music, black culture can be erased. Mm-hmm. There are so many amazing artists and musicians from yesteryear and generations gone by that even us in, in middle age, we don't know. We don't we yeah. never even heard of them. Mm-hmm. So I, that that's, that's see, see, and for everybody in the, in, in the chat sometimes who will be like, Kim, you need to listen to some new music. Kim, you need to get caught up. No, I will not get caught up. I'm getting caught up on the old shit. Okay. I'm getting caught up on the 20th century because there's so much that I missed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Coming from that 20th century music. So big up sugar pie to Santo, New York, find her. I think she is alive in New York city. Please somebody go visit her. Take her some flowers. <laughs> Boy, that hype came up, boy. I, I know, like, boy. She <laughs> loves her and sugar pie. I was like, I just stand back. And like, Maybe they're the same height. You know what I'm saying? Shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Word. Oh so God. that's your artist spotlight today. Um, and I will catch y'all later. Peace. What a voice. Oh, what a voice. Here, doctor. That was a treat. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, come out. Pick, pick your face up. Pick your face up, man. <laughs> I just never heard of her. You know, that's all that was. It's like, okay. But I like, I do like to, to going back in the day and picking out those old artists that, and I agree with you, like the, their vocals were stellar. The, the music was sincere. It was all, it was, it was real live music. I go back, I listen to like, you know, groups like the Drifters and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. it was like, oh, this, the, it's like, these cats can blow, they can sing, they got yeah. harmony and all the rest of it. So I'll, every now and then I do that. I just didn't know who Sugar Pie was. And I'm gonna no, stop I, so, yeah. so, <laughs> so I know what my era of music was, and I'm very well versed on my mother's era of music. And over maybe yeah. the maybe about the pandemic, let's say, I became very interested in my grandmother's music, right? Because I mean, m- both of my grandmothers been gone, right? Not not ninety five and two thousand eight, respectively. So my grandmothers have been gone, but separately individually they communicated to me that they used to that they were big fans of ella fitzgerald now we hear ella fitzgerald we hear the we hear the name all the time dog have you ever gone back and listened to ella fitzgerald's music ella can sing yeah ella, ella can blow ella can blow and she I was see. huge huge yes. in her day people don't understand how big ella fitzgerald was even during that time period of sort of racism and all that stuff like people clamored to hear her voice and her music yeah I listen to some of Ella Fitzgerald's music and I think about my grandmother's listening to Ella Fitzgerald's music. And I just think, I said, my grandfathers must have been getting on their goddamn nerves. <laughs> if, they, if, they was, if, the, if these were their jams, right? I'm like, goddamn, granddaddy, what the fuck was you out here doing? 
getting on granny nerves like that. <laughs> granny in here got her Ella Fitzgerald record stacked up. She's running them joints back to back. But yes, I mean, 20th century black music, everybody. Listen, the, the, y'all young people, y'all can have it. Y'all can have all this 2020 shit. You can fucking keep it for all I care. I'm looking backwards. I'm here to be a standard bearer and a, a griot of sorts for 20th century black music because I assure you it's going to get erased. Uh, by the time we get to 2050, they're going to be talking about how Eminem was a founding father of rap. And, and no, nigga, I will not allow the record <laughs> to be misremembered and misrepresented in that way. Somebody is going to be out here telling the story right it's gonna be me i like that i like that so let's let's get back to our stories um i got one pulled up for us something that's always within our wheelhouse of like trying to make sure we understand what's happening today in corporate america and how that works um and how corporate america works and who gets all the money and who doesn't so something again one of those i i like how you said like one of those water is wet stories <laughs> um so CEO pay has soared by nearly 1,500 percent since 1978, while workers have been left behind. Um, and so this is basically a story about like the how capitalism itself, right, has has supercharged itself to not even worry about again those white workers that they used to worry about or bring along with themselves, uh, bring along with them in terms of feeling some obligation to them. Uh, in terms of wages, the, the sort of the the way in which there was a little flatter back in the day, never fear, but a little flatter. But today, a new study shows that top executives of the largest corporations in the United States have seen their pay soar by nearly 1,500% over the past 43 years, helping to fuel a massive, massive surge in inequality as worker wages lag. It says between 78 and 2021, according to new research, from the Economic Policy Institute CEO compensation at the 350 largest publicly traded U.S. companies rose by an inflation adjusted 1,460%, far outstripping the 18.1% pay increase that the nation's typical workers saw during that period. The trend of soaring CEO pay has continued during the Corona pandemic, which caused mass economic chaos and job loss among ordinary workers. EPI found that while million, millions lost jobs in the first year of the pandemic and suffered a wage, a real wage decline due to inflation in the second year, CEOs realized compensation jumped 30.3% between 2019 and 2021. Typical Eat these motherfuckers. Eat them <laughs> tonight. <laughs> What's for dinner? The CEO put the nigga on a plate. <laughs> Marinate him in salt water. <laughs> Make sure his skin is nice and supple. Y'all start stacking them car them charcoals on the grill. It's time to eat these niggas, man. It says the findings come amid mounting fears of global recession triggered by central banks' attempt to fight inflation via increasingly aggressive interest rate hikes, a strategy aimed at crushing economic demand. Uh, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, the world's most powerful central banker, has been forthright among the primary goals of, of rate hikes a weaker labor market and lower wages. According wow. to the Fed's own projections, rate increases increases could throw around 1.5 million people in the U.S. out of work by the end of next year. What we hope to achieve is a period of growth, the low trend, which will cause the labor markets to go back into better balance, that means hmm. people being fired, that will bring back wage levels down to levels, bring, uh, uh, bring wage back down to levels that are more consistent with 2% inflation over time, Powell said last month. While Powell voices the desire to get wages down as he did during a May press conference, he's not referring to the skyrocketing pay of top corporate executives mm. or Wall Street bankers who have seen, their bonuses, that works. That have seen their bonuses surge by 1,742% since 1985. Um, and it says Powell, Powell's Fed has declined to implement a law to reduce the skyrocketing, skyrocketing paychecks for his former colleagues on Wall Street. Um, and so let me just sum it up a little bit. So some of our observers argue that the exorbitant CEO compensation is merely a symbolic issue with no consequences for the vast majority of workers. Uh, Bivens and Condren note, however, 
the escalation of CEO compensation and of executive compensation more generally has fueled the growth of top 1% and top 0.1% income generating wide, widespread inequality. To begin reversing out of control CEO pay and bolstering wage growth among ordinary workers, EPI recommends implementing higher marginal income tax rates at the very top, which would limit rent seeking behavior and reduce, um, reduce the incentives of executives to push for such high pay. So I'll leave it at that. So as you can see, CEOs and, and like they say, top executives continue to see their pay increase. And, and the other thing that this thing does is that it, it does cause increases in real estate prices, increases in rents, increases in housing prices. Um, but what it doesn't cause is increases in their tax rates for the most part, um, as poor and working class people are suffering. Yep. So anytime people, uh, you know, when we're seeing these sort of superficial debates about inflation and the economy and this, that, and the third, and you hear these goofy, usually conservative uh, lawmakers talk about, well, the wages are too high and the Biden administration is doing too much spending. How come we don't ever complain about the wages of CEOs? <laughs> not not we specifically, but, you know, mm -hmm. but we, hear, we, we hear these discussions held in mainstream spaces. It's always critiques about the workers and workers are expecting too much but the 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 critique never extends to the tremendous disparity of compensation between CEOs and and the the the, the, the grunt workers, basically. I know one of the points of contention compensation was one of the points of contention in the recent Minnesota, nurses strike that was happening in and around Minneapolis and St. Paul. And what the nurses union did they on their website, they listed by hospital, um, the, the, the top administrators, what their compensation was and the ratio of that pay compared to the average registered nurses pay. Um, so for example, one hospital administrator had, you know, salaries north of 1 million, north of 2 million. And that was 48 times more than what the average registered nurse earned at, at the same hospital. And that's what they were arguing. Like, why the fuck these motherfuckers get $2 million compensation packages while me, overworked, exhausted, registered nurse, am only getting paid $55,000, 60000 So no, the workers are, are hip to the shit. This is all, all included in the things uh, re regarding their compensation demands, they, they are pointing out the the stark contrast between what those at the top are receiving, and and the kind of work that those at the top are doing for that for that compensation versus those who are actually making the thing go and, and what they get paid to, for to, for for keeping the machine going. And 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 like you said, like so when they talk about inflation or economic troubles. It's never wrapped around the compensation of the rich. It's never wrapped around the tax breaks again that the rich they get. It's never wrapped around the fact that these huge corporations sometimes not only don't pay taxes, but get tax refunds or get other different types of tax breaks. Those things are never the things that are destabilizing the economy. Instead, it's always it's it's always the workers are getting too much. There's too much unemployment benefit insurance, the, re, the sort of the rebates during COVID. There's all of these other driving reasons that they want to attach to what makes the puts the economy out of whack, but never a focus on the fact that corporations are literally hoarding wealth. I think I seen I saw something about Alphabet, um, uh, the parent company of Google, making a profit of about eleven billion dollars in a quarter, and that was a disappointment because the expectation was that they're going to make thirteen billion dollars last quarter, and instead they made eleven billion dollars last quarter. Um, and, and can you imagine the amount of resources that could be put back into the economy if uh, they were taxed properly or if their employees at the lower levels were paid living wages or paid uh, uh, um, above living wages to make sure that they could survive in, in a larger economy? So these, you know, and, and what they do overseas compared to what they do here. All of that stuff matters in terms of fixing an economy if that was so the folks desire, but the desire is not to fix the economy, the desire is to blame and to train working class folks to, to know what their role is according to what the feds tell us our role is, is to work for less pay and to be grateful that we have a job 
because otherwise they're going to continue doing what they're doing and, and make sure that the, the labor market contracts um, as they say, as they think that is the way to fix an, an economy that is unbalanced. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's critical that we support, you know, when workers take these strike actions, we have to support them. When we're seeing the unionization efforts gain momentum, we have to support it. And listen, I know unions are not perfect. Unions are fraught with their own bullshit, okay? But basically, when you're on the job, you would rather have the union there than not have the union there, right? And we can work on improving the 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 inner workings of the union and, and their internal biases and bullshit we can work on that but the union needs to be there the union where you if you're a worker you need representation you need to be part of an organization in this form um of, of union action so uh you know come out you know when i was coming up younger in the work world it almost felt like the unions almost didn't exist you know what i'm saying and i feel though now like for example generation z is like, no, <laughs> we need unions. Because when you look at some of these more visible unionization efforts from like the Starbucks Workers Union, the Amazon Labor Union, these are younger people. These mm -hmm. are not 40 something and 50 something. These are 20 somethings. In some cases, even teenagers, 18, 19 years old that are the, at the fore of these organizing efforts. So I, I you know, let, let us look to the youths <laughs> for, for the inspiration, but also look back historically at the ways in which movements and organizations were able to to gain victories and and get get some things that would ultimately benefit workers and families so we're we're in interesting times right now but fuck those ceos though fuck that no i completely agree. like you know one of the, the 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 better things that have come out of this this pandemic we've been in is the uptick in attempting the form of labor unions even independent unions that are not associated with some of the larger ones but like you said, even those ones are better than not. Like it's better for folks. There's no survey that's ever taken that shows that unionized workers are somehow worse off than workers who don't have unions. Every survey, any study will show you that the benefits, the pay, uh, the ability to collect bar collectively bargain uh, does nothing but improve um, the, the life chances, the, 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 the betterment of people's personal lives because they'll have more resources at their at, under their control. And then, you know, obviously thinking organizing wise, when the union does the things that the union does is supposed to do, it means that collectively those dues that are used can also be, uh, can play a big role in hopefully, hopefully not only politicizing people, but pushing issues of concern um, that are a benefit to workers. Obviously the thing that we have here in the United States is that too many unions cozy up um, to corporations and strike these deals with corporations that are around, um, you know, including things like uh, like tearing down forest or um, and sometimes they'll strike deals uh, around uh, building unnecessary new structures, huge new structures like stadiums, or there are strike deals around mergers being good things. So sometimes we know unions look at some short term interest um and they don't look at the long-term fight and so that's obviously the issue with particularly unions here in the united states but overall even in during this time period it's better to fight for one to have one to collectively bargain and to radicalize one than it is to go without absolutely check your email sir i sent you i think a cbs news package um that gave more details about the young man who committed the school shooting allegedly in recent days in St. Louis. In St. Louis, I, I got mm, that for you. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things about this that I find interesting and, and worthy of discussion. Obviously, uh, if you don't know, uh, high school in, I don't know, was it actually in St. Louis City proper or was it in St. Louis County, uh, but in the St. Louis metro area, uh, two people were killed at a recent school shooting, allegedly committed by a 19-year-old former student. Now, what I found interesting about the story, is there a video? Um, I see a possible video, but I'm not 100% sure if that's just a commercial or a video. Hmm. So what came Here we go. out? Okay. No, that's a commercial. Oh, no, so, you continue reading, yeah. 
so this 19 year old and I'm sorry his is his name there at the top because I can't keep all these names straight <laughs> I have to be perfectly honest there's a lot of names to 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 keep up with it regardless the student he was he was a former student 19 years old apparently had a number of mental health issues that his family was very proactive at trying to get him help they got him counseling they were aware that he was in possession of a number of guns they called police to have the guns removed from his possession he was also um, committed for psychiatric services I feel as though all of the things that parents of troubled young people are told to do, it sounds as though this family did. And, you know, there's that aspect of it. But also the fact that there have been so many school shooters of white descent who have managed to make it inside of a jail cell to go to trial most recently, Nicholas Cruz, the one who shot up Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. In Michigan, white student Ethan Crumbly is currently being held right now for allegedly murdering, I think, a half a dozen of his Did schoolmates. we have a mic go out? My mic? No, we can hear you. I'm confused. <laughs> what? <laughs> I think we can. I think everybody can hear you right now. Yeah, doctor. Are you trying to say yeah, something? You good now? You froze for a second. Right. Oh, okay. Sorry. So anyway, basically, the white shooters managed to, to to shoot and kill their classmates and make it inside of a jail cell, make it to the point to be arrested, make it to the point that they will be facing trial. But as soon as they saw the police, that is, saw that this shooter was black, they took they 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 they, they made no attempts. Um, to preserve his life in the same ways that they preserve the life of of white shooters. I just wanted to make that observation. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like this is a sad case all the way around. Like you said, like it seems like the family tried to do things to have the gun taken away um, for this person to seek it some some mental health. Um, I'm, you know, so it's it's, um, it's it's again, it's just a function of this society, right? It's just a function of this society that when you allow kids and adults to get their hands on AR-15 assault rifle or assault rifles, even handguns, and the amount of ammunition I think he had at his disposal that you are around something like that. Yeah. So it's 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 just one of those things where with the mental health issues that people suffer from in this particular country that don't get treated. But again, the plethora and access to the weaponry to act out in a way in which people are taught to act out a lot of times, right? So we, you know, I don't want to blame movies and film and music, whatever like that, but the way this culture is surrounded by violence, that is very, it's very history and the very propagation of how you solve problems or relate is this basically through that lens that these things are not, you know, again, other countries are shocked when these things happen or something even close to something like this happens because it's so rare. Um, but here again, it's something that we just expect to take place. We expect it to happen. We count the number of dead and then we move on to knowing that, you know what, not only in a day or two, but literally in a two hours, the same, the same scenario is going to repeat itself in some way or form, whether it's at a school, a club, an office space, um, you know, we just live in really dangerous times um, where the idea that mass shootings is just such a common occurrence and literally there's no real protection to stop it. And for and and the lack of I mean, I hate to even say compassion because the young man committed a heinous act. He did something horrific. He, he took two lives. He injured a number of his of his former classmates. I mean, that that that, that that's inexcusable. But what's apparently clear is that this young man was mentally troubled, like this is documented. Um, and there's so much compassion for even for, for, for white folks, even when they do dangerous things, horrific things, murderous things. Oh, well, what, what about his mental health? Maybe he wasn't well, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's like all, all of these excuses can be found for, for the white shooter, again, who is at, more often than not apprehended alive. But this young man, again, committed heinous acts, 
but clearly was troubled and everybody knew he was troubled. The police knew he was troubled. He was, they were aware of his situation. His, his family had engaged law enforcement and the medical community to try to get him care. Now, I don't know what the circumstances, I don't know if he allegedly pointed a gun at police. I, I don't, I, I don't know any of that. Um, but I think that like the white shooters, he should have been able to have been a- apprehended alive and face the consequences for his actions. But, but, you know, that, that, yeah. that obviously did not happen. So, yeah, um, I think we are coming to an end. I think this is our last story. Um, and I think the ear doctor is going to come on the screen with us. Are you coming here, doctor? You're having some problems, ain't you? Right? Because that, that was a, Ooh, you on fire, son? I'm on fire tonight. Maybe you're you the one with the, the mic problem. Say that again. Nah, somebody else in the uh, chat room said, uh, Somebody else Y'all hear me? it was a quick problem, but we okay. good now. Wonderful. But uh, go ahead, uh, Kamal, uh, before I let everybody know what's coming up on Black Power Media this weekend. There we go. What, yeah, you heard me? me? Yeah, I don't know if it's me or or if it's like, I feel like my, my internet seems to be working, but your shit was all gobbly glue. Word? Nah, It's nah, better nah. now. Now it's better. All right, so before you... Were you about to get to another story at uh no we got it's 958 son okay i was about to say story, story time done story time is wine. all right so boom check this out at 12 noon we got the riot starter coming on today we got a special joint coming on with that later on tonight at seven we got real talk with dr sundiata and i will be on there talking about music all right um, all right Okay, I like, that pick. I like that pick. Let me see that again. Do that again, son. Let me see this pick. I'll be trying to, trying to get my GQ on sometime with the Kooji hoodie on. Uh-huh. Moving it up. Yeah, I like <laughs> uh, also, we got a uh, uh, I mix what I like coming on in the morning and mm-hmm. Warrior Class. Uh, what we got on your side, Kim? Burn it down with Kim Brown, 7 p.m. Um, the, the shit is still happening around the LA City Council. I think there was uh, so some confrontations either yesterday or the day before at, at LA City Hall between the police where the police were called out in riot gear to, to clear the chamber, so to speak. So I'm going to see if the homie uh, Richie Sojenko from the People City Council can join us. Uh, but no, the, you, the Black Lives Matter LA chapter has a 24-7 encampment, or at least they did happening outside of one of the LA City Council members' homes in which they want to resign. So, I mean, I had to say, I had to, I had to say, <laughs> like, I, I, I appreciated that action there from, from BLM LA. I did want to give him a, 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 a smidge a bit of credit because the, that, that action indicate, you know, they with the shits on that regard, hashtag operation resignation. All right. Ooh. And then once again, Sundays, come check out the, come to the cookout and see who's all got invited. <laughs> Whose um, arm is that, son? Did you oh. transpose my arm on your face? Is that it? Nah, that's 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 me when I take the shirt off. That's when I got the, the, the wife beat on. So fine. It's not called they, they don't call it that no more. They call it just a regular undershirt. Oh yeah, yeah. Who came up with that? The, I think it was the Italian guys that was beating their wives that always wore their shorts. Your arm did your arms ain't look like that in like 30 years, probably. So. Hey, and listen, guess what? Next week we got a lot of stuff coming up. We should have more of our hosts back. We'll have Jackie back. Um, also, Jared will be back. Jared will be back, and we got some uh, a guest out of the comment section that left comments that's going to come on next week. To say, no. Yeah, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You will see. You will I don't see. believe it. So I don't stay tuned. It. And also, for our Patreon and members only people, we got something at 11 o'clock tomorrow talking about. The House of Dragons. So we got a whole mm-hmm. bunch of y'all, man. That's what all of a sudden next week. Some 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 people internet not, not gonna be working. They're gonna be sending oh, emails. Word. I can't make it. Comcast right. cut me off. Xfinity tripping. <laughs> <laughs> we we we've been begging people to come up here, and y'all y'all keep y'all keep faking. So I I'm I'm assuming who I don't even know who it is, but let me just be clear. Well, I, whoever it is, I have a feeling they're gonna come with an energy <laughs> of 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 not showing up. That's what I'm saying. So chill on. Don't, put that, out. Don't put that out there, Kim. Come on. I think they're scared, right. man. I, I think at the end of the day, the reason people ain't coming up here is because they're scared. Not saying they're scared of us. They just might be scared generally. So they're gonna lose. They're gonna lose they their job. Be scared. They're scared of me. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I know we, we we targets out here. All right, with that said, this is Black Power Media. This is the Remix Morning Show. We catch y'all next week. Peace. Peace.